From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host David Feldman, who despite obvious conflicts of interest, refuses to recuse himself from the show. But what does recuse mean? David, I think after all these years on the show, I think you know what the word recuse means. Well, as Steve Martin said to Emile Zola, j'accuse me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I tell you, David, there's no end to your corn. <laughs> yeah. However erudite it may sound. <laughs> well, that voice you just heard there was the voice of Ralph Nader, the man of the hour. And we have a great show for you today. On today's show, we're going to be talking to, to distinguished linguist and uh, international best-selling author George Lakoff about the language progressives use and how they can use it more effectively. We will also be joined today by Washington Post columnist Christine Emba, who is going to discuss how we might want to hit the pause button and think a minute before we dive headlong into making robots virtual reality, and other revolutionary technology an essential part of our lives. As always, we will get the latest corporate crime report from the intrepid Russell Mokhyber, the Max Payne of the corporate crime beat, and we'll also try to get to some listener questions. But first, if you have ever heard or used the expression framing, as in framing the debate or framing the message, that usage has become a common part of our lexicon due to the work of our first guest who the New York Times referred to as the father of framing. David? George Lakoff is a cognitive linguist and professor of linguistics at UC Berkeley, where he has taught since 1972. In his book, Moral Politics, he demonstrated that the difference in worldview between liberals and conservatives arose from two different idealized views of the family, a strict father family for conservatives and a nurturing parent family for liberals. In his international bestseller, Don't Think of an Elephant, Know Your Values, and Frame the Debate, Professor Lakoff outlined in detail the traditional American values that progressives hold but are often unable to articulate. The all-new Don't Think of an Elephant picks up where the original book left off, and it delves deeper into how framing works, how framing has evolved in the past decade, how to counter propaganda and slogans, and more that we hope to cover today. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor George Lakoff. It's a pleasure to be here and always a pleasure to talk to Ralph. Thank you very much, George. And listeners, this is one program you really have to listen and absorb because it will improve the way you communicate to your neighbors and friends and others who uh, you wish to change minds or get them galvanized on your side. I want to start by referencing Frank Luntz. Frank Luntz is the Republican word consultant, and he tells the Republicans how to use words that will camouflage the plutocratic intent of the various issues and agendas and programs that the Republicans want to advance. One of his most famous ones is how he got the Republicans to quickly replace the phrase estate tax, which they want to abolish, and which affects a fraction of 1% of the richest people in this country, with the phrase the death tax. And he's so certain about the Republicans accepting his views and the Democrats being tone deaf when they're advised by people like you, that he was once asked, well, if you were a Democrat, what would you call the estate tax? in order to get people really behind preserving it rather than getting rid of it, which the Republicans almost did in the Congress a few years ago. And he said, simple, I would call it a billionaire's tax. And then he laughed. And someone said, well, aren't you giving the Democrats, you know, some free advice that may be used against your clients? He didn't care. Which raises the question, George, why don't the Democrats listen to you? Very good reason. All of framing has to do with the fact that most thought is unconscious, and that in fact has to do with the fact that all thought is neural. That is, ideas don't float in the air, they're in your neural circuitry, and so all thoughts that you have are there in your neural circuitry. And if you have a worldly view that you use to operate every day, 
then that's a very, very complex neural circuit that is fixed there. And you can only understand what your worldview allows you to understand. Now, moreover, you don't have conscious access to your neural circuitry. So most of your thought is going to be unconscious. And if conscious thought is very small, conscious thought is about 2%. 98% is about unconscious. And that is something not recognized by most Democrats for a very interesting reason. When you go to college, what do you study? Well, if you're a conservative, you're probably going to study some business economics, and then you'll take a course in marketing, and marketing professors study my field, cognitive science, and how people really think in terms of frames, metaphors, narratives, emotions, and so on. But if you are going to college as a progressive and you're interested in politics, you'll probably study political science, law, public policy, economic theory, as opposed to business economics. And then you'll get a very different view of what reason is. You'll learn that reason is enlightenment reason from Descartes in 1650. That is, it'll assume that all thought is conscious when it's 98% unconscious, that it's all logical and it works by logic when it really works by the logic of frames, metaphors, narratives, and emotions. And in addition to that, and that's normal rational thought, it's not irrational to be that way, that's how people normally think. And then you will think that the reason you have rationality is to achieve your material purposes, so you'll think that what you should do is always offer people more material goods. So what that hides is just about all of unconscious thought, and it hides your moral theory. Now, all politics is moral. Now, most people don't realize it, but if you think about it for a minute, any time a political leader says, here's my policy, do what I say, the assumption is that it's right, not wrong. He never says do it because it's evil or because it doesn't matter. I mean, the assumption is it's right. And if you have opposite policies, you have opposite moral views. Those moral views are usually part of your cognitive unconscious, but they're so deep that they are part of your identity. That is, you're not going to give those up. And that's what's very important about this. That creates what is called the neural filter. You can only understand certain things that your brain allows you to understand. And if you are a conservative or a progressive, certain things will make sense to you and other things won't make sense to you. So when you talk about unconscious framing, for many, many progressives, that's not going to make much sense. What do you mean unconscious framing? Then you give examples and you see how that works. But the point well, is give, give that... Some, uh, give some examples. All right. The very first one I wrote about was from George Bush on his first day of office. What he talked about tax relief. Now, tax relief has the following frame. It has the idea of relief. It says that there's something bad happening to you and that you need to be relieved from it and that anybody who relieves you from that, that is a hero and anybody who tries to stop you is trying to harm you and that's a villain. And then tax relief says that taxation is the thing that's harming you. So that if you're for tax relief, then you're a good guy and if you're against it, you're a bad guy. Now, he said that every day after it, day after day after day. Well, why does repetition matter? Repetition matters because tax relief is an idea that is partly metaphorical, partly has to do with the relief frame, and partly the idea that taxation is the harmful agent. And when you put those things together and you repeat them, they are in a neural circuit that gets stronger. Every time that circuit is activated by language, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So what that does is give anyone who hears it the idea of tax relief. And pretty soon, the New York Times was talking about tax relief on its front page, not realizing they were using a right-wing phrase that would help get the right-wing ideas across. Mm -hmm. And then soon you got Democrats talking about tax relief for the middle class. What would be your advice for the Democrats? What phrase should they use? It's not just the phrase. It's, it's the idea. Taxes yeah. are an investment. They're investment in public resources. What we know about the way that this country works from the very beginning is that the citizens care about other citizens, work through the government to provide public resources 
that provide for the well-being of everybody, and that starts with business. I mean, you can't have a business without public roads and bridges and sewers and, you know, all the scientific things that have been developed and so on. All the public resources are there, you know, for ordinary, everyday folks. You want to have safe food. If everybody is sick, you're not going to be able to run a business, much less, you know, live a private life. You want to have air you can breathe, water you can drink. You don't want, you know, to have lead in your water, and so on. These are public resources that you have. But you see, how do Democrats reduce that to the simple phrase that the Republicans always come up with, like tax relief? Okay, you've explained what taxes do for a civilized society and how important they are for the infrastructure and for health and safety. But how do you deal with two or three word slogans that really score on voters? How would you boil it down? The private depends on the public. It's not just government. It's the public. It's you and me. Public resources are necessary for everything. All of science, all of technology has come out of that. Where did you get computer science from? The NSF. Where did you get satellite communication from? NASA and NOAA. You know, think of cell phones for one minute. I mean, if you know anything about how cell phones work, there are 24 satellites up there at a 51-degree angle circling the Earth, and you have to beam up from your cell phone up to the closest satellite. It has to go satellite to satellite around the Earth to, to talk to someone on the other side of the country or the world, and then down to the next phone to within 15 to 30 feet. How fast does that have to go? The answer is very simple. It's nanoseconds, a small number of billionths of a second. If you're a millionth of a second off, that is a thousand times a nanosecond, if you're a millionth of a second off, you're off by hundreds of miles. You can't have anything in any cell phone in the whole world working without that system maintained by the U.S. government and your taxes. You are paying for the economic possibilities of the whole world and the communication possibilities of the world. And the Russians and the Chinese are trying to build a system of their own right now. But in the nanosecond media, the interviewer would have said to you, Professor Lakoff, we're out of time. He cut you off. You got George Bush saying tax relief. You're making a rational argument with a frame about what taxes have provided for us. But it's a soundbite society. So how do you counteract Frank Lund's sound bites with our sound bites, progressive sound bites, even though we can elaborate it in a much more persuasive way than the thin-based Republicans? Well, remember that Lund started in 94. By then, the conservatives have been going at this in 67. That is, he had you know, 20 to 30 years behind him of people saying things out loud over and over, Remember, the Leadership Institute also started in 94. They have, you know, they train leaders, conservative leaders, to think and talk conservative. They've, in the first 20 years, they trained 160,000 of them going on talk radio over and over. On those talk radio shows, they say their things not in sound bites, they say them in arguments. And those arguments have been out there since 67 in the Nixon campaign. They've been out there over and over, and Luntz depended for his sound bites on previous arguments. Do you think that the Democrats have underestimated the political impact of Rush Limbo, Sean Hannity, and all these day by day drumbeat right wing talk shows that on radio? Do you think they've underestimated the impact, especially on white male blue collar voters who? very often tune in when they're working on a construction site or some project to Rush Limbaugh. They also are very often strict fathers at home, people who have a view that they're the boss of the family, that the family depends upon them, that they have authority in their families. And if they have that view at home, that will map onto a right-wing politics very easily. So it's not merely that they're working people. It's that they're working people with a certain worldview that goes along. Now, what Rush and Hannity do is they follow the prescriptions of the Leadership Institute. The first thing you learn at the Leadership Institute is you never use the language of the other side. Even to negate it, even to argue against it, you never use their language. Why? 
because the language activates those ideas. And the more that language is used, even if you argue against it, you're going to, you know, activate those ideas and make them stronger. So if you go and listen to MSNBC constantly, what you'll find is people on the left arguing against right-wing ideas using right-wing language. They'll say, so-and-so said such-and-such such today, Trump said this using his language, and then he'll say, well, the facts show this, the facts show that, and they'll keep using Trump's language, helping Trump. I've seen that time and time again. Let me quote you in one of your writings. You say, quote, everyone likes to think of himself or herself as a good person. That means that your moral system is a major part of your identity, who you most deeply are. Voting against your moral identity would be a rejection of self. That is why poor conservatives vote against their material interests. They are voting for their moral world views to dominate and for respect for their values, end quote. But how can they vote for people who want to freeze their minimum wage, poison their streams, not repair their schools or roads? Because of the neural filter. Remember, if you have such a worldview, you can only understand those things that fit that worldview. Now, what that worldview says is that the right moral way to think is this way, and that the people who think and act this way are the moral people. So if you say these moral people are doing immoral things, that doesn't make much sense, especially if it's part of who you most deeply are. What are the moral views of the Republicans that conservative poor people in Appalachia, West Virginia, Kentucky, and elsewhere are now voting for. I have a wonderment about how these people cling to a moral view by right-wing Wall Street corporatists who do them in from the coal mines to their public services like health care. You are talking about the facts, the true facts. They're real. You're absolutely right in terms of the world. But you're not right in terms of how people think and understand and how brains work. I hate to say this. I wish it were otherwise. I wish that the world worked according to the way the facts are, but it does not. Well, then what are the moral principles that are governing these poor conservatives' uh, voting patterns that leads them to vote for the Republican corporatists? Let's start with a strict father family. In a strict father family, the father is the authority because father knows best, father knows right. And when everything he says is the right thing to do, his job is to make sure that his children and his spouse do what he says because it's the right thing to do. And if his children disobey him or don't respect him, he is required to punish them until they do. That's called tough love. There's an actual word for it, tough love. That's what that means. So he has to punish them until they do what he does. That means that they may instinctively want to do what feels good. You've heard the term feel-good liberalism. That means liberals have not had, not had a good enough strict father. If they don't do what feels good but instead do what their father tells them, then that takes discipline not to do what feels good. If they get that discipline, the logic is they'll be able to go out in the world and become prosperous. So there's a logic. What if they're not prosperous? then they're not disciplined, they can't be moral, so they deserve their poverty. That's why a lot of conservatives will think that people who are poor are lazy. You know, that's part of the rationality. But it goes way beyond that. If you think that authority, if you have your authority because you know right from wrong and it's your job to enforce what's right, what does that mean? It means that if that is the natural way the world works, and the assumption is this is true, this is how the world really should work and does work, then you look at history to see who has won out, to see who has naturally, by a law of nature, come out on top because they were right. And so you get, well, religion has won out, you get God above man. Man above nature, we're conquering nature. Nature is there for us, we can do what we want with it. You have the strong above the weak. We need a strong government to defeat everybody else. You have the rich above the poor, the employers above the employees, adults above children in 21 states, 
teachers and coaches can beat children with sticks and paddles if they you know, don't show complete respect. Uh, Long military, you, police power, all those things you're talking about, the father figure? You got it, police power, all of those things. And then it goes on. Western culture above non-Western culture, America above other countries, men above women, whites above non-whites, Christians above non-Christians, straights above gays. Let me interject here. Senator Jim Inhofe, who's a Republican conservative from Oklahoma, once was asked by a reporter, how do you keep winning elections, Senator? And he looked at the reporter, smiled, and said, it's simple. God, gays, and guns. Right. Is that a moral framework for poor people voting for Republicans? What it does is evokes it. Those words evoke, one, God, God above man. The guns is the powerful. Guns give you power. You have a gun over somebody, they better show you respect. You know, guns yeah. give you power and authority over other people. And gays have to do with people being low on the moral hierarchy. So what you have is a representation, a small representation, that evokes the entire moral hierarchy, which evokes all of strict father morality. What happens is that the language activates the thought, and the thought is complex. And if you go through that moral hierarchy, just go right, run right down it, you'll see every uh, right-wing proposal for policy that has ever been given. It's all well, right there. A, let, let's get right down to a specific situation. In 2000, West Virginia was a Democratic state. In 2016, it was overwhelmingly pro-Trump and Republican, including state legislatures, etc. Now, let's say you're standing before an audience of 500 people who are lower income in a town in West Virginia that is been strongly Republican in their vote, in their mind, they have all these moral frameworks and metaphors that you just have spoken of, and you are trying to persuade them with a progressive agenda in their own interest. You're trying to say, we have to raise the minimum wage, full Medicare for all, you shouldn't have a pay or die health care system, we want to provide adequate public services for you and your children. We want to protect you from corporate violence, which is the poisoning of your streams and rivers and chopping off your mountaintops. We want to produce more solar energy jobs, which already are spreading in West Virginia, putting up solar panels on homes, very decentralized, less dangerous than coal mining. We want to tax the rich more so that you are less burdened. We want to give you, quote, tax relief, end quote. And we want to crack down on corporate crime in this country that abuses you as workers, consumers, taxpayers, and exploits your community. How does that affect the receptors in the audience? It will boo you off the stage. However, there are ways to talk. For example, one of the major things that has come out of all this study is, first of all, we know that there are moderates. What is a moderate? A moderate progressive is someone who is mostly progressive but conservative on some issues. A moderate conservative is somebody who is mostly conservative but progressive on some issues or other, and they don't necessarily overlap. There is no ideology of the moderate. There's nothing that all moderates believe, so there's no center. But one of the interesting things about conservatives is this. There is a phenomenon called in-group nurturance. You care for people in your in-group, in your church. If people are good church people, hardworking folks, and they're down on their luck and they're going to lose their homes, the church people try to help them, either to get them a place to live or maybe even build them a house. If people in your military group, you try to help them. The military takes care of its own on military bases with free education and housing and, you know, and cheap goods at okay. the PX and so on. Now, in communities, what happens is that a lot of arch conservatives politically will care about the people in their families, people in their bowling leagues, people they go barbecuing with, their neighbors, their friends, their communities. You uh, have a flood, you will see 
the conservatives out there swinging their sandbags, helping their neighbors from being flooded and maybe helping the people downriver from being flooded. This is something that you see all the time in conservative communities. There is in-group nurturance, and it's real. They really do care about them. So the question then is, how do you use the fact that they do care about people in their in-groups? Not the out-groups, not the other people, you know, who are, you know, not the San Francisco residents or the New York residents or whatever, but, you know, people in their in-groups. And the answer is, in a way, very straightforward. How do you take care of someone in your in-group? Suppose you want a drug. It would be nice if the drug worked. Well, we now have a law, which the Republicans have pushed through, that says that drug companies can do their own, don't have to do testing. Now, it turns out when you test drugs for efficacy, for whether they work, 90% fail. The Food and Drug Administration turns down 90% of the drugs. If that is taken away, you will never know whether your drug worked. You're taking a drug for whatever disease you have, arthritis, you have, you know, whatever, cancer, you have any kind of thing you have. This goes through, you won't know. Therefore, you want to be sure that the Food and Drug Administration is staying there, that your drugs work. And what is stopping it? Deregulation. Things that take away, what is a regulation? A regulation is a protection for you. We've been talking with Professor George Lakoff of the University of California, a cognitive scientist. How does your perspective, before we get to clever Trump and the way he used words, how does your perspective explain that for years before 2000, the Democrats prevailed again and again in West Virginia, and West Virginian Protestants even voted for John Kennedy, the first Catholic president? Isn't that a contradiction here? Well, first of all, they're conservative Democrats in the South, as you may know. There's a long history of the solid South, which was Democratic, and which, you know, was where Republicans were seen as, you know, being against racism. You know, Republicans were seen as the bad guys for a long time. There's a long history of conservative Democrats in the South. You know, now they weren't all conservative Democrats. There are people like Byrd, who was great and others who were, you know, quite wonderful figures who managed to understand in-group nurturance, who managed to be able to talk to those folks about how their families worked, how their communities worked, how their churches worked, and so on, rather than talking at the level of general policies, rather than talking at the level of, you know, at which you were talking before about corporatism. You know, birds go down there and talk about corporatism. You know, he, he talked about, you know, what was going wrong in your communities and, and in your families. And I think that's very important, you know, that you go to people where they live. So the Democrats became more and more detached, more and more out of touch with the way these people back home think, feel, act, deal with community, neighbors, deal with abstractions, deal with concrete metaphors and the reason for this is they went to college they they studied political science and law and public (laughs) policy they learned enlightenment from 1650 they abstracted themselves from communicating with the people who they needed the support from to be put in office now you have a section in one of your papers called clever trump and someone told me that trump won the election the primaries and the general election with about a hundred words with clever context and in your article you say that nine months before the election i wrote about how trump used the brains of people listening to him to his advantage here's a recap of how trump does it unconscious thought works by certain basic mechanisms Trump uses them instinctively to turn people's brains toward what he wants, absolute authority, money, power, and celebrity. And then you list the mechanisms. So tell our listeners what the mechanisms are and how they can be countered in the future because he's going to use them again and again. Well, the first one is repetition, that you say things over and over. And one of the things that goes with repetition is what is called preemptive framing. That is, you set a frame first 
that is, you set the, uh, what, what is a frame? A frame is simply a metal structure that's used to understand anything at all. Anytime you're thinking, you're using a frame. You know, every word is defined relative to a frame. So he'll say, crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary. Well, you have the word crooked, you know what a crook is, you know what that means. There's a frame for it. He says, crooked Hillary, over and over, and other Republicans have been saying that for decades before that, and you repeat it over and over, and the idea that Hillary is not to be trusted is out there, over and over and over and over in your head. And it's in everybody's head, because even if you hate Trump, and you don't like him, you think he's horrible, you hear crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary, crooked Hillary, and you wonder repeated about Hillary. The mass media, and the mass media repeated it. And the mass media repeated it all the time, and they still do. Okay? So that's and how about win-win-win? How about win-win-win as a frame? The same thing. That is, the idea is that this is a zero-sum game that you want to win to get to achieve your purposes. That achieving your purposes means winning over other people, and other people are the losers, that you have to defeat people. What that says is that you don't cooperate, you fight, you win, you try to overcome people, right? Constant. And that the country needs to do this, you know. You have to win, the country has to win, etc. How about fear? Use of fear by Trump. Use of fear is very important. It says that there's an enemy, that you're going to get hurt, and you need a hero to take care of you. That's me. And then there are other parts. You know, take the Mexicans are all criminals and rapists and murderers and so on. There's a phenomenon that Daniel Kahneman noticed back in the 1970s. There was a well-publicized DC-10 crash in Chicago at O'Hare Airport when a DC-10 in a storm took off and made a bad turn in the wind and crashed. And that was shown all over the place. And people stopped flying DC-10s when, in general, DC-10s were the safest plane in the world. Now, what happened was the following. When you see that DC-10 crash over and over in your brain, that changes your brain, you know, because that image gets activated over and over and it gets stronger, stronger, stronger until you associate DC-10s with crashes. So what happens is that something that is repeated over and over and over gets stronger and then you see that as a higher probability. Now, there's another case in San Francisco. There was someone who was from Mexico who was supposed to be deported but wasn't who found a rifle in a car, picked it up, and shot a woman to death. Okay? So this was shown on TV over and over and over, and Trump picked it up, and he said, look, Mexicans are murderers, because what it says is if you have a Mexican murdering someone over and over and over in your brain, it says this is a high probability that Mexicans will do that because the stronger this gets in your brain, the higher the probability that will fire and that you will understand it that way. Now, Trump uses this all the time for cases that have been high probability in the media, and then he assumes that everything works this way, and he'll convince you that way because your brain works that way. How do you counteract that? Let's say you were one of the candidates during the primary on that stage. How would you counteract it? You list other techniques he used. Of course, his slogan, Make America Great Again, Make America Safe Again. And you talk about the calling somebody out, the metaphor system used in the phrase, quote, to call somebody out. You talk about the Trumpian metaphor that naming is identifying. And you've got... Millions of people watching these debates, and you're on the stage. And the moderator says, all right, Mr. Lakoff, what's your response? The answer is you can't. You can't do it alone. The media is the prison. That's correct. And that's why I'm involved in starting a citizens' communication network. We want to get citizens who are, I want to be active about this and activist organizations to say things that are true, that are believed, that they believe honestly, over and over, with effective language, to get people to see the truth, that regulations are protections. You get rid of regulations in the EPA, you get rid of protections. You said use the word poison. You can use the word poison. Absolutely. For you pollution. Know, yeah. Pollution. 
you can, you know, say, look, folks who put lead in your water are poisoning you. They're poisoning you. Apropos your suggestion just now, George, let me quote you. It is vitally important people know the mechanisms used to transmit big lies and to stick them into people's brains without their awareness. It is only possible with the acquiescence of the media and the inability of the Democrats to deal with it, end quote. So what would be your advice to the Democratic Party as we conclude? I would say the following. Right now, you know, when it comes to global warming, the Democrats rail reasonably against science deniers. They're, you know, they're science. But the Democrats are science deniers about their own brains and their own minds. They don't take neuroscience and cognitive science seriously. They don't look at their own view of what reason is. They don't take what we know scientifically about the kind of reasoning they're using. They don't take that seriously. They're science deniers, and they need to learn about that. That is part of the idea of saying, well, we're logical and we're rational, you know, and we know the facts is to know the facts about your own mind. And that is crucial. You have to know how people think and how they work. That is something that Democrats need to know as soon as possible. And they need to get that out there. And what we're doing with the Citizens Communication Network is to try to do that. And we're trying to work with, you know, nonprofits to help them express their ideas better and so on. Before we give you a opportunity for a contact for this excellent proposal of yours, to elaborate your thought just now, in your paper, you give Democrats an idea. It comes from the concept uh, that strict fathers cannot be losers, dependent, weak, childish, and especially not a betrayer of trust. That characterizes the counterattack, I would assume, to Trump, correct? Exactly right, and it's in the book Moral Politics. That's right. If you want to understand how this works, you have to understand that Trump has betrayed the trust of his own people. That Now, they have to understand what that trust is. Betrayer of trust is a big deal. You know, in a strict father family, the father can't betray trust, you know, quite simply. And the big thing about that is, you know, he also can't be a loser. That drives him up the wall, doesn't it? He lost the popular vote. He can't stand that. I mean, he's really signaling linguistic vulnerabilities, isn't he? Well, more his name does, too. Uh, I have a paper on Trump's name, on the sound symbolism of the name. TR words, as in you know, triumph and trample and so on, have to do with force. Ump words, like dump and rump and clump and so on, have to do with things that are just sitting there. The linear order of force and something sitting there has to do with causation. That is, his force turns other people into lumps, right? That's what <laughs> is about that's you know that's why the word trump is used in car games and so on or or in general this trumps that but if you imagine a kid who can't pronounce tr and says thwump that doesn't sound very strong if you change the u to r you get thwimp imagine someone voting for president thwimp <laughs> no, wouldn't work you run for president and your name is thwimp doesn't work imagine thwimp tower doesn't work so his very name is part of all of this. You mentioned that he can't stand to be accused of being dependent, like on his ch- chief strategist, Steve Bannon, or others, because that signifies he's weak. And you put these words in bold face, dependent, weak, betrayer of trust, loser, a minority president. Well, why don't you tell our listeners how they can learn more about your communication system that you're well, proposing? We'll soon have a new website for it, but one, they can go to my blog. It's George Lakoff, one word, dot com, and look at the blog. You can go on my Twitter feed, which is at George Lakoff, capital G, capital L, one word. You can go on my sort of a public Facebook page as opposed to the private one, and all that stuff will be there. So for now, what we're doing is using my Twitter feed and Facebook page until we get the Citizens Communications Network set up as a proper website when we'll shift over. But right now, just get it, and you'll get lots and lots of materials. Well, thank you. We've been talking with Professor George Lakoff. 
One of his recent papers is titled, A Minority President, Why the Polls Failed and What the Majority Can Do. Seems very current and very pertinent. Thank you very much, George. Your last name is spelled L-A-K-O-F-F, for those of you who are going to his blog. And I'm assuming that on your website, this paper is available. Is that correct? It's correct. It's there. It's pretty. (laughs) Nice typeface. Enjoy it. And, you know, thank you, Ralph. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure here. We've been speaking with George Lakoff, who is a new updated edition of his bestseller, Don't Think of an Elephant. We will link to all of his work at ralphnaderadiohour.com. Now let's slip away for one minute and check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokiver. Russell? From the Nash Bros. Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Report on Morning Minute for Friday, March 31, 2017. I'm Russell Mulkyber. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau took action against Experian and its subsidiaries for deceiving customers about the use of credit scores it sold to consumers. Experian claimed the credit scores it marketed and provided to consumers were used by lenders to make credit decisions. In fact, lenders did not use Experian scores to make those decisions. The CFPB ordered Experian to truthfully represent how its credit scores are used. Experian must also pay a civil penalty of $3 million. Experian neither admitted nor denied the charges. Experian deceived consumers over how the credit scores it marketed and sold were used by lenders, said CFPB Director Richard Cordray. Consumers deserve and should expect honest and accurate information about their credit scores. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. We have talked a lot on this show about the effects of technology, particularly the digital economy, on how we work and live. And here to offer another take on that issue is our next guest, David. Christine Emba writes about ideas for the Washington Post opinion section and is editor of, in theory, the Post's Ideas blog. The idea that caught Ralph's eye this week is entitled, Smartphones Changed Our Lives, Let's Think Before We Let Robots In. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Christine Emba. Thanks so much for having me. Your article really hit home because as I walk down the streets, I now count at least half of the people walking down the streets, no matter how beautiful a day with the flowers out and the breeze crossing the sunshine, people are clutching their smartphones. In fact, some doctors have pointed out that more and more people are coming into their office with neck problems. And I'm sure that what they are looking at is not all that important. Let me begin by asking you, what are the five or ten things that people look for constantly, hourly, when they work their smartphone? What are they really looking for? Much of smartphone-induced life is entertainment, and the other half seems to be work. So right now, the Pew Research Center has pointed out that approximately 77% of Americans own a smartphone, period. What they do with it and whether it's from work or for personal use is less defined. I mean, you see people who work in smartphone-enabled environments who are constantly checking their phones to see if they have emails, to see if they've missed a call from their boss, to check on social media to see, you know, if there's information they might have missed. And again, part of that is connection with other people. On your smartphone, you can access Facebook, you can access Twitter, you can look at your friends or enemies' Instagram and see what they're up to. And smartphones and other technologies, especially digital technologies, have in fact been designed to have a sort of addictive quality. You know, they tease you with alerts or, you know, ringtones or buzzes that you're always checking kind of to get the next hit. And this is actually something that doctors and researchers have begun to observe, too, in people who have kind of a nervous attachment to their phones where they experience feelings of a phantom vibration where they think they've gotten an email or they think they've gotten a message and they constantly check even though nothing is there. So perhaps while smartphones were originally used, you know, for basic things like using GPS or occasionally like checking something on the Internet or on Google, we're compelled to do kind of everything on them now. And, you know, they're checking what inning baseball team scores or the latest weather around the corner, in addition, of course, to all their friends. However, you know, as someone who doesn't have a smartphone, I look at it from a different perspective, which is what the smartphone has done, Christine, is make it more and more difficult to get anyone on the phone, like just calling reporters, 
calling people you knew. It's all text message, email. And, of course, that's not the same as exchanging contemporaneously on a telephone conversation. Do you find, as a reporter, that you're having trouble getting people on the phone in contrast to email and text message exchanges? No, you're completely right. I'm actually on, I guess, the young end for a reporter. I'm under 30, and I started working at the Washington Post about two years ago. And one of the things that colleagues who have been at the Post longer have mentioned to me as sort of the biggest change after we moved into a new building and over the years is that it's much quieter in the building. That's true. It used to be that reporters were constantly on the phone, calling people, talking to people, and now they're just sort of typing away. <laughs> and some still use the phone, of course. I mean, I am on the phone with you now. But, yeah, it's definitely, I think, harder to reach people and a little bit less common. And actually, if you talk to any sort of millennial or younger, there's this really strong anti-phone bias. And I honestly, I have it too, where I have friends who, if you were to call them, they would be really freaked out and they would not pick up and would see if you left them a message because they think calling is either, you know, their grandmother's calling them or like maybe their mom is calling them or some disaster has happened. Otherwise, why would you like interfere with someone's life by talking to them with your real voice over the phone. <laughs> and that's true with message. teenagers. You know, years ago, teenagers monopolized the family phone, right? And right. now they don't use the phone at all. It's like they can't stand the tension of going back and forth with another person in terms of voice. And a few months ago, I went down to see Marty Barron, your boss, and the national news editor, Scott Wilson, and I told them that over 50 years of my dealing with the Washington Post, I can no longer call reporters on the phone to give them leads, scoops, give them ideas, because it's all email, and they're flooded with email, uh, and you don't know whether they even get it. So when I leave a message on their voicemail, I have no expectation that someone like Dana Milbank is ever going to get back to that voice message within three days. In fact, he says on his recorded announcement. It's better to email him because he doesn't check his phone messages <laughs> that often. Now, this is just one impact of what you say is a tremendous impact in the last 10 years on our economy, on individuals, on personal business relationships from this smartphone, which is basically about 10 years old in terms of mass production and distribution. You want to describe some of the other impacts that we just don't analyze ahead of time. It's like technology is dragging us into the future on its own terms, driven often by commercial instincts. Yeah, and I mean, that was kind of the, the point of my article more broadly, too, is that the iPhone is 10 years old. And when it was presented to us, we were sort of like, oh, this seems like a cool new thing. Sure, we'll start using it. And just actually never even thought about what it could do, both personally and within the economy. The smartphone has also enabled a lot of economic change, just in terms of the number of businesses, companies, and corporations that are now built around serving and servicing people through apps that they access on the phone. So one of the biggest, I think, and most notable ones is Uber. There's Uber, there's Lyft, there are a number of these sort of car-sharing gig economy services, whereby, Airbnb. obviously, Airbnb, you contact someone on the web often. I mean, Uber, you can actually only use through your phone and book a taxi, basically, or somebody with a car ahead of time. And that's obviously incredibly convenient. Many people find that useful. And I mean, especially, I think, as a woman of color who has a black older brother, there's a difference between, you know, the difficulty of trying to hail a taxi while a person of color at night, for instance, and being able to call one whenever you want. But at the same time, this has driven huge amounts of the taxi industry out of business. That was a business built on people going outside and hailing taxis that were driving around. And now people can just click something on their phone. Christine, what do you think this is doing to the minds of people? This constant back and forth, very little time for reflection. And as a society, very little time for anticipation and planning for these new technologies. Now, I want to quote from your article where you say, we may have time to prepare for the future, but so far it seems that we've preferred to wait and see. Yet if the iPhone has taught us anything, it should be that change comes quickly. The Industrial Revolution spanned centuries and still left society reeling. The smartphone revolution took less than a decade. 
The next major shift, we should try to get ahead of the curve, end quote. Well, you talk about what's coming, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and virtual reality in the form of goggles on people's face. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah. I mean, one of the, I think, major discussions just in the 2016 election was about America losing jobs, jobs leaving America. And most people, I think, especially one presidential candidate, wanted to blame it on you know, China or trade deals. And obviously, trade and globalization have led to some job loss. But actually, I think the real threat that's coming in the next decade or so is automation. And automation does not necessarily always look like a robot with robot arms, you know, coming into your factory, but it's simply the automation of work. If you have to send several emails or, you know, look at a long list of numbers per day, I mean, can a robot do that faster and better? If so, maybe that's where your job is going to go. It's interesting, actually. Even in D.C., this restaurant just opened up called Itza, and it is not manned by humans at all. Like, you not know, one person? No, no. Maybe there are some in the back. Like, I really... It actually kind of stresses me out because I'm not entirely sure how it works. But you go in and get into line, and there are several iPad-like screens, and you can put in your order. They make, like, salad bowls and stuff like that. And then you just sort of wait, and then there's another wall where there are these different sort of – they're boxes that almost look like microwaves. And whenever whatever's happened to your order in the back is done, it appears in one of these boxes, and you take it out and take it away. What if it's a ruined plate and you want it sent back to the cook and get a new one? Great question. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's not a person to talk to in the entire organization, it seems. Let's get Steve and David in here, Christine. What's your view of all this? It does seem that technology driven largely by corporate power, global corporate power, is on a runaway spree and we're not catching up to it. Some leading scientists, in fact, Steve Hawking and others, a couple of years ago, including Elon Musk, warned about artificial intelligence or a robotic world where the robots, in effect, are out of control and take over. I mean, these are practical scientists and engineers who are saying this. I think that they've actually both invested a fairly large amount in trying to get out ahead of this sort of AI revolution, this machine learning revolution. It's interesting when you think about you know, the people who are inventing these technologies are perhaps more aware of the risks and downsides than we are. Steve Jobs, for instance, didn't even let his kids use the iPhone and iPad because he was, you know, thinking a little bit further ahead. And it's interesting that, that hasn't trickled down from sort of the corporate inventors to the people who are every day using these products and perhaps will be encountering these forces more and more in their own daily lives. To illustrate your point, isn't it true that some Silicon Valley executives are sending their children to Waldorf schools? I have heard that, yeah. And even themselves are going on occasionally like digital detoxes or retreats where they are not allowed or able to use technology, the technology that they have invented. Steve, you were saying something? Oh, what I was reading in the Times. Or David, yesterday. this is David. I read that Blackstone, the big money management group, is replacing some of their hedge fund managers with algorithms, with AI. And I think anything, I'm willing to just let the whole thing collapse just to have hedge fund managers <laughs> be put out of work. Right, Ralph? I mean, it's worth it to me for all of civilization to collapse if the hedge fund managers go first. You'll know they're serious when the CEO replaces himself with a robot. <laughs> right. It doesn't, it doesn't really apply to them. <laughs> Steve, do you have a question? Well, I was going to say, Christine, since you're you know a millennial yourself, and you know people like David and I and, and Ralph is in a whole other category are trying to keep up, you guys have sort of grown up with this. How do you press the pause button? How do you... Is it realistic to expect people to sit back and stem the tide? I, I talk to young people in my office here, and they're so crazy about the idea of the driverless car, that that's just an exciting prospect, and they don't really think of the uh, consequences. Is your generation uh, equipped to press that pause button? That's a really interesting question, and it's in some ways really hard to say. I think kind of tacking back to what we were talking about earlier – one of the sort of social effects of technology and the iPhone and smartphones and the way that they can distance us from other people, you know, you're emailing, 
you're not calling and talking to a worker at the end of the line who, like, you have to think about as an individual and how your tone or choices might affect their life. You know, if you're looking at your smartphone and looking down at the street and never looking up at another person, maybe you aren't noticing perhaps the increasing number of homeless people in your neighborhood, something like that. So when you think about adopting, if you're a young person and this has kind of always been your life, the driverless car is already just an exciting thing. Like maybe you aren't thinking about taxi drivers because you've never had to. You've never had to talk to someone like that. But at the same time, I think also young people are a little bit more aware of technology in general, how to use it, you know, what effects it has. And I think younger people, just people who are younger, are perhaps less better at self-control and decision-making. But as they get older and can think more clearly about technology, they can put into place perhaps better strategies for mitigating its effects or, like, realize that there are, you know, other things they value more or less. Do you see any movement among millennials to take stock of what Steve is just talking about and say, look, we need to stop, look, and listen here. Look what it's doing to us. Yeah, well, it's interesting, actually. In my own generation, my own friend group, in fact, there has kind of been a move at times, and it's not always constant, to sort of think about detoxing from these things. People are like, oh, I've realized I'm on Facebook or Instagram too much. I'm deleting my account. Like, I don't want to be that person anymore. I have friends who have had smartphones and then gotten rid of them and have, like, gone back to the dumb phone, the, their, like, classic Nokia, so they can get text messages with difficulty or make calls. And they're doing that on purpose because they're tired of being that person with the iPhone or being around those people who can't put their smartphones down. I know that I've like met up with groups of friends where we're like, oh, guys, like we're all just checking our phone. Like, I haven't seen you in two weeks. Let's all just, you know, let's take <laughs> mm-hmm. this dinner and make it an iPhone free space for a night and just enjoy each other's company. <laughs> and it's all like, a bit strange, it, but you know, it, people do yeah. that. There are positive signs here. I've seen the same thing. I have a grandnephew who's just disconnected completely from Facebook, and he's a very gregarious person, had a lot of friends. And he's very articulate as to why he did it and how liberating it was. Well, I think we're out of time. We've been talking with Christine Emba of the Washington Post. She edits the Post in Theory blog, the idea blog of the Washington Post. And obviously this subject is going to be continually on center stage in terms of discussion in coming weeks and months. What is all this massive technology and the automation and the nanotech and the biotech doing to us and how can we apply our best values to discipline, channel, curtail, and get the most benefit with the minimal cost and still remain human beings? Thank you very much, Christine. Thanks for having me. We've been talking to Washington Post columnist Christine Emba. Her piece is entitled Smartphones Changed Our Lives. Let's think before we let robots in, which we will link to at ralphnaderradiohour.com. And uh, that's our show. I want to once again thank our guest today, George Lakoff, author of the all-new Don't Think of an Elephant, and also Christine Emba, whose post piece I just mentioned there. Let's think before we let robots in. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call the wrap-up, where we talked a little bit longer with both George Lakoff and Christine Emba. Welcome to the wrap-up. We're going to start with an extended conversation with George Lakoff about Joseph Goebbels and Donald Trump. And then we're going to talk to Christine Emba about cyborgs. (laughs) <laughs> we we go on forever, but yeah, I wanted to ask about Goebbels and what he knew and how how advanced this is. Oh well, he knew all of these things. I had a weird experience. I was once called in by the Social Democrats in Germany to give them a training, and I was giving them this training, and somebody pointed out that we were in a building in Goebbels' old building, and we're in <laughs> Goebbels' old seminar room. I said, oh, God. (laughs) It's amazing how instinctual Trump is, though. I mean, you get the sense that he hits that bell again and again with four or five words. Where did this come from? He's a salesman. He's a super salesman. He's been selling, you know, since he was a kid. You know, he knows how to use your own psychology against you. Any super salesman does that. But Ralph touched on something that I was I'm very curious about. 
Do you learn this stuff instinctively? Are there people who are doing this unaware that this is an actual system of influence? Of course. You know, look at anybody who's a really successful salesman. They all know that. They all look at people. They know that by looking at people and, and how they react and how their facial muscles work and well, how their voice is going, they can tell what their brain is doing and how they can manipulate them. You know. So Goebbels, uh, Goebbels was pulling, but Goebbels wasn't instinctive. He was a student of this, right? You can be a student of it too. Yes, he was a student of it, and people in advertising are students of it. You know, go to any ad agency, and you get people who understand all this stuff. It's amazing. Trump has said that he, he could size up somebody in f- less than five minutes, and most of the time he's right, just by meeting and looking at their facial expressions, twitches, the way their eyes mm-hmm. are directed. You know, obviously, what one anthropologist once called the silent language, he has to be a real expert in the silent language you have to hand that to him absolutely he is very very clever at doing this and by the way i didn't get into his tweets but one of the things you find when when you go to get onto the communications network you know i did an analysis of his tweets every tweet is strategic there are four purposes that he has and every tweet fits at least one of those and often more than one But every tweet is a matter of strategy. He's not just sounding off. What are the four purposes? First, there is preemptive framing. You know, the Hillary or getting some idea out first, like, you know, everybody should have nuclear weapons or something like that. The preemptive framing is the first one. Or there was, you know, five million illegal votes. That's why Hillary got the popular vote, right? he He put you in his cocoon. Yes, he puts you in his frame, right? So preemptive framing is one. Diversion is the other. You know, you're under attack for uh, colluding with the Russians, attack Meryl Streep. Then everybody, you know, on TV has clips of Meryl Streep for three days, and they have big debates on CNN on whether celebrities should be talking about politics. Master of diversion. Master of diversion. Okay. Then there's deflection. Attack the messenger. You know, the fake news press, the fake news New York Times, etc. right? So attack the messenger, deflection. They say something to that, that really gets to you, that is, you know, deep and so on. Deflect, attack them, right? And he does it by name, doesn't he? Naming the reporter. Exactly. Attack the messenger. Name the reporter. Get him. Right? And the fourth? The fourth is that I'm, I'm losing it. <laughs> It's on there. I can go look it up if you want. But the, yeah, the main... you, this, yeah, I will. Hold on a second. Yeah. And, and while you're looking it up, I, I guess you touched upon this in the conversation with Ralph. When you throw it back at him, it doesn't work, right? Or it does right. work. Or it does it work or it doesn't. If you use the techniques, it works, but not the language, the specific language. No, it doesn't work when you throw it back at him. It, there's, there's no way because these techniques don't allow that to happen. So, let me get this, and... But if you use the techniques, in other words, if you if you deflect or diverge using different people and targets, does it work? Yeah, those uh, are just traditional debating points, the techniques. Those are just traditional debating tactics. You don't have to use his language, but you have to try to divert to your area of strength when you're making your argument, for example. But you see, in the soundbite media, you don't have a chance to do that. What would you have done, Ralph, if you were debating Trump in front of, you were a presidential candidate several times. If you were on a debate stage with him, would you? I would start by, he's a failed gambling czar. He's gone bankrupt. He's shafted his workers, his creditors, his employees, his consumers. Nobody has failed in gambling like you have, Donald Trump. You are a loser. And and you would have just kept sticking with the gambling. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, no, not just with the gambling, with all kinds of other things, too. That everybody he's dealt with, he has defrauded, fired, belittled. You know, you used your fired thing. Well, anyway, thing- did you come up with the fourth, George? 
The fourth one is a trial balloon. You test the public reaction, right? So you say, hey, uh, what about nuclear arms escalation? Let's try that, see how the public reacts. You know, everybody should have nuclear weapons. We should be using the, we should be nuking these people in the Middle East. You know, what do you think about that? And the next day, people come on to occasional shows who've written books about uh, the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, and the next day, and the day after that, it's gone. Well, this is exactly what President Donald Trump did with his 50 page preliminary budget, spraying cuts in all areas affecting regular people. Every one is a trial balloon. Let's see which one sticks. Well, thank you. Again, th this is a very good overall frame of analysis for people to start thinking about. The overall impression I get from speaking to you, George, is that the people who have old-fashioned progressive agendas that they encapsulate in legislation, like for workers, consumers, environment, community, taxpayer, foreign military policy, have really got their work cut out for them in terms of communicating to millions of voters who don't tune in to those kinds of specifics. And they're 50 years behind the times. The Republicans have been doing this since Nixon started running in 67, right? You yeah, you have daily talk radio. 95% of daily talk radio is right-wing, Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh type. Those yeah. are ideas that are being activated in your brain and strengthened. You know, they're not just things that are thrown out. They're not in the background because when you hear them, suppose you're working and you just happen to hear it. It doesn't matter because your brain hears it and your brain takes the words in. And if your brain understands the words, what that means is you've activated the ideas and made those ideas stronger. And the words are endlessly repeated like Rush Limbaugh's word, feminazis. Exactly. You must have, you got it. You must have said that a thousand times. Oh, and he also refers to the Democratic Party as the Democrat Party. Yes. So he sort of delinks it from the idea of democracy. And well, that's, he took that from Republicans before that. But, uh -huh. the, you know, the point is that these guys study this stuff, you know, and they learned it, you know, from people who teach courses on it. You know, if, again, any business school, you know, teaches courses on marketing and how to market your ideas. That's right. Well, this has been very good. Thank you again, Professor George Lakoff. To be continued, I'm sure, this is a major, major challenge in politics and democracy in America. Ralph, I'm so glad you're there. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> okay. Thank this you. is great. Thank okay, you, you know, it plays, it plays 11 a.m. on Monday on KPFA in your area. Okay, 11 a.m. on Monday in KPFA. Great. And I will, right. I will send you the link to also the podcast version, which then... Oh, good. Then we, what we'll do is we'll put it on our communications network. Excellent. Yeah, we'll do that. Very Thank good. You, sir. I'm, I'm going to look into this. I wasn't aware of what you were doing on the communications network, but I can get all well, the details on your website. Well, there's more stuff that's not there yet. We're working yeah. with Indivisible. On April 17th, I'm going to be giving a talk to Berkeley Indivisible, and that'll be live streamed to 5,900 chapters. And, you know, so we'll be, and we're, we're working with the communications people there, and we're trying to, yeah. to figure out the best things that they can use, get feedback for them when they have problems, and try uh -huh. to, to do better. So By the way, with, George, this, yeah. this is really, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just to add to your repertoire, the other day, <laughs> these Democrats never learn on Capitol Hill. You know, they talk senatees. Anyway, the other day, Nancy Pelosi accused Trump of, quote, deconstructing the federal government, end quote. That'll get people out in the streets. <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. Well, you see, the thing is, <laughs> Bannon comes along and says he wants to deconstruct the administrative state. Now, the, you know, see, what the hell does that mean? There's actually an excellent op-ed in the New York Times, March 20th, by um, Professor Philip Hamburger of Columbia, where he explains exactly what he means and why Gorsuch believes it. You know, what he yeah, means he, Philip is, thinks that's illegal constitutionally. 
it is an unconstitutional delegation of legislative power to executive agencies. His book is like yeah. 500 pages. <laughs> so, that's right. Yeah. You've got it. Exactly right. That's what he said. He believes it, and that's what Bannon is about. And Gorsuch right. believes it, too. Oh, it's- Mulvaney was brilliant when he was calling it an act of compassion to coal miners to cut funding for Meals on Wheels. Why? And this was an act of compassion because it, it made them work to get the money for the for the meals. Well, he doesn't say that the coal miners need Meals on Wheels. He's saying that coal miners pay taxes, and why should it go for Meals on Wheels? We have to right exactly. It, it, the coal miners pay taxes. Yeah, you got that's the the old Bush used the same argument, and you know we have to get these things out there every day. I mean, we have to know exactly what to say. And what we're trying to do is put this together, and it is a hard job. Where I mean, does this leave Orwell, George? We didn't mention Orwell. Orwell barely got it. You know, I did a study yeah. of Orwell. And, you know, Orwell is fine as far as he goes, but he doesn't get most of this stuff. You know, I, I have a paper on what Orwell didn't know. If you want, I can wow. you, you look up my name and, and Orwell on, on Google and you'll get the paper. But yeah, we'll there's the- on what Orwell didn't know. And Orwell was fine as far as he went and then, you know, lost it. Yeah. Wow. And then he named names. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very, very much, George. Let's do this again. Always a pleasure. Take care, Ralph. Yeah, bye-bye now. And now we had a conversation with Christine Emba about cyborgs. Christine, can I just ask you a quick question because you're under 30, and I think Ralph might find this shocking. Have you had conversations, serious conversations, about whether or not you could have a relationship with a cyborg, with something that's part human, part machine? <laughs> Have you and your friends were, had, had – because I, I have spoken to people maybe a little younger than you where it's not just a hypothetical, but it's an actual concern. It's no longer yeah. science fiction. Yeah. Huh. I mean, I personally have not and also don't think that I could. <laughs> but <laughs> there has – so one thing that I have noticed that's happening in conversation is – in discussions of VR, like virtual reality, there's a lot of conversation about like virtual sex uh, and like what sort of resource that could be or what it would look like. And I guess like in other countries, especially, I know Japan is always at the forefront of these things for some reason, but you can, there are programs and like things that you can buy where you have like a holographic sort of assistant or kind of like an AI machine thing that like becomes your housekeeper and like helps you with tasks and people have been known to fall in love with them, um, which <laughs> was a movie two years ago, I guess, her, but is also apparently real. The cyborg thing, I, I think we're still, I think we're still a little bit distant from that just because we don't have like human machine melds yet. But then again, there's also like a small and burgeoning movement starting naturally in Silicon Valley of people who are interested in human machine enhancement who kind of call themselves cyborgs because, you know, they've implanted a chip or something Mm -hmm. in their hand or in their body. And so they can, like, activate, you know, like magnetic checks and stuff like that. Um, Bill Gates has invested in it. Bill Gates, Christine, has invested in this. He's been investing in this. Well, you listen, I have an artificial hip, so I I consider myself part (laughs) cyborg. Well, there you go. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay, this is good. Thank you again, uh, Christine. (laughs) This is a huge subject. I really wish you luck on your blog and getting people to think, because the whole technology is out of control. I mean, we know that, and it's it's accelerating at a tremendous rate, and you don't have congressional hearings anymore. You you know, you don't don't have the institutions that used to educate the public, and and you have soundbite mass media, you know, television, radio. And the value system is also, I think, just our, in general, the way that we understand value and, like, what a good life looks like. The consensus mm-hmm. has changed, um, and the norms are changing. So, yeah, I'm interested. And, you know, there, there's, no, there's no legal or ethical framework for any of this. Exactly. Notice that. Yeah. Uh, nanotechnology is not regulated. Biotechnology, barely. 
artificial intelligence, forget it. And yet, you know, in the past, you know, it'd be a new technology, a new boat or something, and the Congress would have a hearing and try to have safety standards. So you've got a huge area for you to plow, that's for sure. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, thanks. I'll be writing about it for a while, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. Now, Steve, you, you got your artificial hip from DARPA, and <laughs> it's changed the way you think. Did you know that? I, I, I No, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, we're like 10 years away from somebody who is paranoid schizophrenic being utterly convinced that his artificial hip is talking to his brain, and he may be right. I'm going to write that movie. A transcript of this episode will be posted on RalphNaderRadioHour.com. For Ralph's weekly blog, go to Nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyver, go to CorporateCrimeReporter.com. Remember to visit the country's only law museum, the American Museum of Tort Law in Winstead, Connecticut. Go to TortMuseum.org. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. We'll talk to you then, Ralph. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jimmy. And one last note. Why not think up your own words and phrases and develop what I might call irresistible rhetoric backed by irrefutable evidence?